Alexis Perkins, Mary Walker, Josephine Cochran, Mary Anderson, Katherine Johnson. Many of these names are virtually unknown. They may be praised among specialized scholars, but they are certainly not familiar to all. Now consider this list. Thurgood Marshall, Desmond Doss, Eli Whitney, Steve Jobs, John Glenn. To most, these names are much more familiar. Why? One reason for this is that the first list of names contains only women. However, the men in the second list served in similar positions and achieved similar goals to the women in the first list. Frances Perkins was a member of FDR's cabinet. She fought for a minimum wage and drafted the Social Security Act. Mary Walker received the Medal of Honor for her work as a Civil War surgeon and remains the only female ever to receive this award. Josephine Cochran invented the automatic dishwasher. Mary Anderson invented the windshield wiper. Katherine Johnson designed the trajectory for John Glenn's orbit around the Earth and personally checked the calculations. Throughout history, women like these have been doing influential work, often behind the scenes. The founding mothers of America are a prime example of this. Their many contributions for the sake of our nation remain practically unknown. These women are also fascinating examples of virtue. Virtue is defined as behavior showing high moral standards. Examples of virtues are prudence, justice, temperance, courage, faith, hope, and love. In his speech for Aulus Licinius Archaeus, the poet, famous orator and Roman politician Cicero lists virtuous people worthy of imitation. He says that by meditating on such examples, people can cultivate virtue in their own lives. Proverbs 13.20 says, walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Being around wise people produces wisdom. Studying virtuous people fosters virtue. Women were indispensable during the American Revolution. Koki Roberts, former political commentator and author of Founding Mothers, describes the efforts that women made to aid in the war. Women ventured into all kinds of spheres. They went with soldiers to camp. They organized boycotts of British goods. They petitioned the government. The generals on both sides of the Revolutionary War marveled at the strength of the women. Despite the vital role that, Amer that women played in the American Revolution, much more is known and taught about the founding fathers than about the founding mothers. A National Women's History Museum study of the Standards for U.S. Social Studies Education found that in 2017, public schools were required to discuss 737 historical figures. Of these, only 178 were women, with many being taught only in specific states. This clearly shows the lack of importance that society places on learning about women in history. Because studying virtuous people fosters virtue, people should look to the founding mothers, such as Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Eliza Hamilton. The life of Martha Washington shows the virtue of love. Abigail Adams' life demonstrates the virtue of justice. Eliza Hamilton's life provides an example of courage. First, those who study the life and actions of Martha Washington will find that she exemplifies love. The Bible defines love in 1 Corinthians 13. It says, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. One way that Martha Washington showed love was in her perseverance during her marriage to George Washington. She often received unwanted attention. Koki Roberts says that Martha was frequently targeted by political and even military opponents since she was married to such a powerful man. In fact, the royal governor of Virginia sailed up the Potomac River, planning to capture her. She was also attacked by the press, who said that she was secretly a loyalist and had divorced her husband because of their political differences. Martha worked hard to correct these false rumors. She endured harassment, slander, and physical threats for her husband. When Paul describes love in 1 Corinthians, he says that love always perseveres. Martha persevered through hardships in love. Martha Washington also showed self-sacrifice by supporting her husband's war efforts. Martha did not enjoy being on the battlefield, according to Roberts. However, she continued to visit her husband during his winters on campaign. The National First Lady's Library explains that Martha Washington was the main caretaker for her husband during the Revolution. She encouraged his soldiers and made food and clothes for them. When she was not visiting her husband, she managed Mount Vernon by herself. 
According to Flora Fraser's book, The Washingtons, George trusted Martha to manage his estate while he was away. This required her to deal with financial issues, as well as a drought that produced a poor harvest. Martha Washington sowed self-sacrificial love by visiting her husband during the war and managing their estate so that he could remain with his soldiers. Martha Washington lovingly set an example for all future first ladies by entertaining political guests with hospitality and grace. Flora Fraser says that Martha did not particularly want her husband to re-enter public life after the war ended. She was afraid that it would ruin their family. She even complained to Eliza Hamilton that she should be called the chief state prisoner rather than first lady. However, despite her personal desires, she held the position with grace and cultivated a good image for herself and her husband through the events that she held. Paul's description of love says that love does not dishonor others and is not self-seeking. Even though Martha did not relish the role of first lady, she did what was best for her country and her husband. She was not self-seeking. Martha Washington is an example of love due to her work as first lady and devotion to her husband. She visited him on the battlefield, managed his estate, and cultivated an excellent image for him. These examples show her virtue. Another example of virtue is Abigail Adams. She displays justice. Cicero describes justice in his work on moral responsibility as serving the common good. The Bible commands us to practice justice in Micah 6, 8, which says, And what does the Lord require of you? To do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. One area in which Abigail Adams exemplifies justice is in her early advocacy of women's rights. According to the National Museum of American History, married women had no legal identity apart from their husbands. Single women and widows could own property, but only New Jersey extended voting rights to them. All citizens are deserving of rights such as these, and Abigail believed it unjust that such basic rights were not given to women. She discussed it with her husband, John Adams, since he was such a powerful lawmaker. One letter that is often quoted reads, I desire that you would remember the ladies and be more generous and more favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion, and we will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Adams was ahead of her time. She valued women's education and made sure that her daughter was educated in Latin. Walter McDougall says in his book, Freedom Just Around the Corner, that Abigail considered patriotism a virtue more noteworthy in women than in men, since women serve their country without hope of recognition. Abigail Adams fought for the common good. She desired justice for women and should be studied as an example of virtue due to her beliefs and actions. Along with believing in the rights of women, Abigail Adams also desired to give slaves equal rights and bring them justice. According to the Journal of Women in Educational Leadership, she championed the abolishment of slavery. She wrote, I wish most sincerely that there was not a slave in the province. It always seemed a most iniquitous scheme to me to fight our for ourselves what we are daily robbing and plundering from those who have as good a right to freedom as we have. She thought that denying rights to slaves was hypocritical when Americans were busy fighting for their own liberty. By not owning slaves on her personal farm, she was an example for others. She wanted them to see that slavery was not necessary and advocated its abolition. She fought for the common good. Another reason that Abigail Adams is an example of strength and justice is because she was politically active, well-informed, and vocal on a variety of political and economic issues. David McCullough says in his book, John Adams, that Abigail wanted to invest in government securities. She recommended this to her husband, John Adams, and McCullough says that their family would have prospered financially if he had listened to her. During her husband's presidency, America faced impending war with France. According to Woody Holton, author of the biography Abigail Adams, Abigail believed that America should have made a declaration of war against France. In these issues and more, Abigail Adams proved herself to be intelligent, knowledgeable, and a warrior for justice in America. Finally, those who study the life and actions of Eliza Hamilton will see her as an example of courage. When discussing Plato's view of courage, Josh Wilburn says, Non-rational impulses threaten to destabilize our rational judgments, and the courageous individual is someone who, despite the psychological pressures posed by such impulses, continues to maintain her correct reasoning about what is valuable and how she ought to act. Those who have courage are not swayed by outside influences or hardships, but continue to do what is right. Eliza Hamilton is one of the lesser known founding mothers, but she is an excellent example of virtue. Eliza lost her son, sister, mother, 
father and husband within three years, but she stayed strong and continued working for the good of the country. Her husband, Alexander Hamilton, was tragically shot in a duel with Aaron Burr. Eliza Hamilton did not let these events break her, but remained courageous. Ron Chernow, author of the popular biography Alexander Hamilton, describes her as a woman of towering strength and integrity. Chernow stated in an interview conducted by the Smithsonian that he thought that anyone else would have been broken by the tragedy that Eliza faced. Not only did she live, but she prevailed. Deaths were not the only hardships that Eliza had to endure. Her husband had an extended affair and published the details of it, as described in Willard Stern Randall's book, Alexander Hamilton, A Life. Eliza Hamilton did not leave him or tarnish his reputation, but bravely persevered in their relationship, according to Roberts. It took great courage for her to open her heart to him again after his affair, but she showed her fortitude through her love for him. Chernow says, Eliza never surrendered her conviction that her husband was a noble patriot who deserved the veneration of his countrymen and had been crucified by a nefarious brand. Her later work for orphans, her constant delight in talking about him, these and many, many other things testify to her unflinching love for her husband. As previously stated, courageous people maintain their correct reasoning about what is valuable and how they ought to act. Eliza knew that her relationship with Alexander was important and she remained dedicated to it, showing her courage. Eliza Hamilton bravely poured her heart into helping others. She and some of her friends started the first private orphanage in New York City, according to the Smithsonian. According to Chernow, Eliza believed that children should be able to read in order to study the Bible. She helped start the Hamilton Free School, which was built on land that she donated. Eliza Hamilton courageously invested in members of the upcoming generation. Despite her husband's unfaithfulness, Eliza still worked with courage after his death to protect his name. Her husband gained much recognition for the work that he did as a statesman, and this work is due in part to Eliza. Chernow explains that she gathered personal stories and letters about Hamilton in order to protect and share his legacy. Ron Chernow writes that Eliza was certainly the most self-effacing founding mother, doing everything in her power to focus the spotlight on her husband. Beneath an animated, engaging facade, she was loyal, generous, compassionate, strong-willed, funny, and courageous. Eliza Hamilton proved herself to be a courageous and influential woman, and her work continues to impact Americans. Through studying the lives of Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Eliza Hamilton, people can cultivate virtue. Some may say that focusing specifically on women in history is furthering a harmful feminist agenda. This is not the case. There is a certain kind of unhealthy, unbiblical feminism that seeks to elevate women by putting men down. However, feminism is defined as the principle that women should have political, economic, and social rights equal to those of men. The important word in this definition is equal. Giving honor where honor is due is a biblical concept. Romans 13, seven says, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Honoring these women represents the right way of acknowledging women's strengths and virtues. The Bible frequently recognizes and celebrates the accomplishments of women as seen in the examples of Esther, Ruth, Mary, and many others. People can study the founding mothers and bring light to their influence without discounting the actions of men of that time period. Some may also say that these women are relatively unimportant since their husbands were significantly more influential to the growing nation. There is no question that the founding fathers were essential to the inception and success of America. However, their wives often had a hand in their work. Cokie Roberts makes it clear in Founding Mothers that women often assisted the men but remain unrecognized. For example, Eliza Hamilton helped Alexander Hamilton write many of his dazzling speeches, including Washington's farewell address. As previously mentioned, Martha Washington managed her husband's estate so that he could be present on the battlefield. The founding mothers were pivotal to the influence of their husbands, and they should be studied alongside them. Philippians 4.8 says, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Christians should study things that are excellent and praiseworthy and work to cultivate virtue as commanded by God. Studying women like Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Eliza Hamilton will aid in this endeavor. They exemplify love, justice, and courage, which the Bible encourages us to pursue. While this thesis focuses only on these three women, there are so many more who have been ignored or overlooked by history. People should study the women in history in order to learn from their examples and develop virtue in their own lives. Their stories are waiting to be told. Thank you.
Thank you, Lindsay. How do you think that the public knowledge of women leaders has changed now since the time of Martha Washington and the other historical females? For example, do you think that the majority of people understand and appreciate women leaders more now than before? Um, I think that women leaders are a lot more appreciated than before, and part of that is just because the information is a lot more easily accessible now than it was before. Like, for the founding mothers, um, a lot of them burned a lot of the letters that they wrote because they wanted their correspondence to be private, and so they burned a lot of their things, and it also is just hard to read. Sometimes the letters, uh, Roberts talks about how they're um, nearly illegible sometimes because of the handwriting. But people have made that information accessible about the founding mothers. And because today, with digital technology and all that sort of stuff, women are a lot more, um, just people know a lot more about the women leaders of today just because the information is a lot more easily accessible. Should we also pay attention, and to pay attention to and learn from evil women of history in the same way that we learn from men like Hitler or Nero? I don't think that we can discount people just because they're evil. Like, I think if we said that we weren't going to study Hitler at all, then that would not be the right way to approach that. But I think that we learn about them in a different way. Um, we learn about Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Eliza Hamilton because of the virtuous actions that they did, and we're able to develop personal virtue based on that. And so we study these women because they've proven that they're worthy of study because their actions were virtuous. And so if we can take virtuous actions from evil women or learn what not to do, then yes. Who are some other women that history teachers should be incorporating into their curricula? One that I was going to include or that I considered including when I was uh, curating my list was Dolly Madison. She was James Madison's wife, who was our fourth president. And Dolly Madison is generally known in respect to James Madison or from the famous story that she saved the painting of George Washington from the White House when it was burning during the War of 1812. But she actually did a lot more than that. Her beliefs were super revolutionary for her time period. Um, she held a lot of events at the White House and was just super revolutionary during that time. And so I would love to learn more about her. Have you observed virtue in any first ladies in your lifetime? If so, who and how? Ooh. I am gonna be completely honest and say that I haven't paid a whole lot of attention to politics, but I do think that we can learn from, I'm gonna take Michelle Obama as an example, that we can learn from just the way that she talked to her peers and the way that she presented herself in front of people. Like yeah, um, when we go low, or when they go low, we go high and the way that she interacted with children and that we can take from that. Why do you think that virtue is not valued in today's society? I don't know that that's incredibly relevant to the scope of my thesis, but I will say that some of it might be because of just again, a lack of knowledge. Um, obviously, as Christians, we know that virtue is something that we need to be cultivating because the Bible commands us to, but people who haven't read or studied the Bible wouldn't necessarily know. Like, they know that virtue is a good thing, but they probably wouldn't spend as much time focusing on cultivating it. If you could go back in time and meet one of these ladies, who would it be? Eliza Hamilton because she was the inspiration for my thesis, was her story, and she did so much. I wasn't able to include all of it, but she started an orphanage, she started a school, she fostered a lot of children, she was just, I think, an incredible personality. She lived more of her life without Alexander than she did with him. She actually died at the age of 97, which was 50 years after her husband was shot, and she did so much during those 50 years, and I would love to talk to her and learn from her. What would you say to recent, com recent comments of evangelical leaders about Beth Moore's role in the church? Many conservative leaders do not believe she has a place in leadership because she is a woman. So the role of women in the church is outside the scope of my thesis because I'm talking specifically about the Revolutionary War time period and about these women, but I believe that God has created men and women with separate roles and they can both play those roles the way that God ordained them to. Were any of the, the ladies that you studied Christ followers? If yes, would you describe them as submissive to their husbands? Why or why not? Yes, so Martha Washington was a avid Christ follower. She frequently went to church. She had all of her children go to church with her. If you visit 
you can visit the church and sit in the pew that they sat in. And she was submissive to her husband in that she, well, she took on the role of first lady when she didn't want it. And she did all of those things. She held all those dinners and parties and things. And she cultivated an excellent image for him when she didn't have to do any of that. She could have just said, I don't want to appear to the public because I don't want to. And I don't want to have these parties and have this picture of me because that's not what I want. But she did what was best for her country and for her husband and through that, yes. Thank you, Lindsay.